I meant to say thank you to Daniel for playing Daniel Locker, playing organ for us today. Thank you, Daniel. It's wonderful. So I want to say, and I know a lot of you share this experience, ever since uh, I turned 50, since I've been on the other side of that, I feel like, I'm going to take this off, sorry, I feel like I spend a lot of my time searching. You know, I'm I, searching for something I just had in my hand and I'm trying to figure out where I set it down. Searching for the reason I entered a room or just picked up my phone and I can't remember what I was going to look up. I'm searching for the word for something or the name of something. I just feel like I'm constantly searching. And I actually have a history of this. I'm known in my family for having a blind spot right here in front of me. And I'll give you an example. So I'll be, in, I've, we have bakers in our family. My daughter, she'll say, hey, could you grab the flour out of the pantry? So I open the pantry. I look where the flour is supposed to be. Don't see it do a methodical search of the entire pantry, and I come to a very sound conclusion. I say, it's not here. Somebody used it all, or it was stolen. <laughs> and as that's happening, I get elbowed out of the way, an arm reaches past, grabs the flower right there, rolls eyes at me, and goes back. And for just a second, for just one second, I think, they're playing a joke on me. That wasn't there. There's no way that was there. It's a magic trick. It's something, or it's just amazing, or they're just incredible at finding things. And the last thing I get to is the truest thing I get to, which is that I'm just terrible at looking for things. And I tell you all of that because that is actually another way to understand this Bible story we just heard. Right? Peter is fishing all night catching nothing. He comes to the shore and Jesus is there and he says, hey, push your boat out. I want to teach. And Peter's mending his nets as Jesus teaches. And he says, you know what? Push out and drop your nets where I show you. He says, oh, no, no, there's no fish. I have looked all night and there are no fish. And Jesus says, just try it. So he goes, he drops the nets. He pulls up so many fish and he can't believe it. And he says, you are amazing. I'm not good enough for you. I'm too sinful. You should get away from me because you are the most amazing person I've ever seen. And yet, maybe he's just terrible at fishing. <laughs> maybe he's just really bad at it. Those fish were there and he just couldn't catch them. Maybe that's the story. But if that's the story, why would Peter follow him? Why would he believe in him? Because he could catch fish? Would you follow somebody who could catch fish? And this isn't the only instance of people following Jesus for absurd reasons. In the Gospel of John, Philip is so amazed by Jesus' teaching, he goes to his cousin Nathaniel, who's sitting under a, a fig tree, and he says, hey, Nathaniel, you've got to come. This guy from Nazareth is amazing. And Nathaniel is just a kind of a racist jerk. And he says, ah, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. I'm not going to listen to him. And he says, no, come on. And he comes and Jesus says, oh, here's a guy who tells the truth. He says, what do you mean? He says, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel is amazed. He drops to his knees. He says, that's incredible. I'm going to follow you. And I, every time I read the story, I just think, well, somebody could have told him that you were under the fig tree. <laughs> I mean, he could have just mentioned it. So how do we know? Why do we believe? Why did they believe in Jesus? Why do we believe in Jesus? Why do we believe any of this? Why do I? Why do you? Especially in this time when people believe all kinds of absurd things that we can't even believe. I've had long and painful conversations with somebody who says the vaccine is a plot to wipe out humanity. We just heard this week that the Republican National Committee said... The January 6th event was legitimate political discourse. This is what people believe. It's nonsense. It's like somebody caught some fish and they said, oh, I'll follow you. So how do we believe someone? How do we choose? Why Jesus? What I come back to over and over again, and I think it's the answer to this question, is the parable of the sower. 
Remember this parable? The sower goes out to sow and he's planting seeds. Some seeds fall on the path, it gets eaten by birds. Some seeds fall on the rocks and they spring up quickly, but when the sun comes up, they have no roots and they wither. Some seeds fall in the thorns and the thorns choke it so it can't live. And some seeds fall on good soil and flourish. And to me, what this parable means is we receive what we are ready to receive. And it's really hard to tell what kind of soil we are because we receive and let grow what we prepare ourselves to let grow in us. What we are ready to give life to when it comes to us. Jesus says you're going to know a tree by its fruit. Right? You can't gather grapes from thorn bushes and you can't gather figs from thistles. And what that means to me is the way we measure anything that grows in our lives is by the measure Jesus gave us. And how do we measure? We measure it in what Jesus told us was most important. Love God, love your neighbor. Does something in our lives lead us to greater love? Then it's of God. If it leads us to hatred or derision or cruelty or separation from one another or oppression, then it is not from God. The example I've used a hundred times, and I'll keep using it for the rest of my life, is people who are Christian who want to teach that God doesn't love gay people for who they are. And I say, does that teaching lead to greater love or greater hatred in the world? To me, the answer is clear. So it's not Christian because it leads to hatred. It's not who we are. So we know we have these measures. We can look and see, does this lead to more love in the world? And the question is, what kind of soil are we? What are we ready for? And the thing is, it's not about figuring out which kind of soil somebody is and judging, oh, they're thorny. You know, they got something choking the life out of them. Or their, their roots aren't deep. It's not it. They're a path. They're too hard to ever hear anything. That's not it. We aren't one thing. This story of the sower, if you've heard me talk about this story before, I can't help it because this... I, I heard somebody one time who transformed the way I think about this story. I was in New Orleans, and a preacher got up, and I rolled my eyes because he had dirty jeans on, and he just looked kind of unkempt, and he wasn't a good speaker, and I thought, bleh. And I wasn't good soil. I was pretty much the path, maybe thorny, but more path in the sower parable. And he started to talk about this parable, and it turned out he was a man who, following Katrina, was helping to build community gardens in the Lower Ninth Ward. And that was what he did every day. He made gardens. And what he said about this parable has stuck with me forever. He said, you know, when I go out to make a garden, there is no good soil. You don't go find a place in the lower ninth ward that has good soil. There isn't any. You have to make good soil. You got to get the rocks out. You got to get the thorns out. You got to get the weeds out. You got to turn it into good soil so that something can grow. That's the job of Christians. To turn ourselves into good soil, to help other people become good soil. See, the point isn't we're one kind of soil. We're not the path or the thorns or the rocks or the good soil. We're all, all of them. And we need to make ourselves into good soil. So how do we do it, right? How do we do it? Well, it takes work. It takes a spiritual life. You know, should we go to church? We pray, we worship, we do service. Not just for the sake of doing it, but so that we can grow, so that something in us can grow, so that we can be the good soil who will give life to something that will be of meaning to our world. And if we want to help somebody, what's the best thing we can do? We help them be good soil. What will help them prepare for growth? Is it derision? Is it hatred? Of course not. That doesn't make good soil. That turns us into paths. Too hard to receive anything. First, we look to somebody's basic needs, and then we say, okay, how do we create a situation in which they can grow? Whether it's somebody we care about in our family or our wider community. So back to the story of Peter. 
on his knees in that boat saying, Jesus, I'm not good enough. Falling on his knees because he caught a lot of fish. And of course, the answer to all of this is that the important part of the story isn't the fish at all. It's that Jesus preaching and speaking to them on the boat. He says, here, take me out on your boat so I can teach. And Peter sits and mends his nets and listens all day. And he's turned in to good soil. He's made ready to see something he's never seen before. And he's looking for a reason to follow. And the fish is just the switch that flips. Peter didn't follow because of a boat full of fish. He saw God in the world and it changed who he was and it let something grow in him that gave life and hope to others. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's how we know who to follow. What is it that gives us life and helps us grow and give life and hope and love and compassion and justice to this world? Peter didn't see Jesus as God in the world because he was unique either. It wasn't because Peter was this special person who got this gift and he alone could see Jesus. That's not it. It's because he was ready to see it. And that's the point of all of this. We are all called to follow. God is revealed to each and every one of us every day. And the question is never, when is God going to be revealed to me? The question is, when are we going to make ourselves ready to see God in our midst? If we do the work, the work of listening, the work of learning, the work of growing. And not to finish and say, okay, I've done all those things. No, we do all that to prepare ourselves to see God in the world and then let that grow in us. Thanks be to God. Amen.